Oh yeah, that looks cool. Oh, I got a shooting star though. Or is that just a plane? I guess it's a plane because I can hear it. <laughs> so, you know, we're here in Grand Teton National Park and I'm really excited to capture some astro here because I've actually never taken astro photos here. So I'm really excited to get into it. There are several spots that I've scouted out and I think we're going to get some really cool reflections in the water um, and I really, really can't wait. see the Milky Way right now just with your eyes it's so dark here. Bringing your camera out at night can be quite daunting if you've never done it before but every single person is capable. Once you know when and how to shoot astrophotography uh, it can get quite addicting so I'm warning you. <laughs> hey everyone my name is Autumn Schrock. I'm a travel astro and landscape photographer, and I'm here to chat all things astrophotography with you. We're gonna take some photos of the night sky. It's one of the most magical forms of photography, uh, but also one of the most challenging forms of photography. Before you even leave your house, I think it's important to get all of your settings prepared um, and not just exposure settings, but also just camera settings in general, um, because it's so much easier looking through all your buttons and knowing what to do while you're inside in the light than it is outside. But there are also several other preparations that you need to make. First one is weather. Of course, if the sky is cloudy, you're not going to be able to see the stars, which means no astrophotography. I use an app called Windy, which is a great app for predicting cloud cover. I found it to be quite accurate, so I highly recommend checking that out for any of your astro shoots. Second is light pollution. Uh, if you're near a city, if you want to shoot something that's near a city, you're probably not going to be able to see the Milky Way because of the light pollution. So I like to use a website called darksightfinder.com and it's a really great tool for finding where the darkest skies are all around the world. Um, so basically, all you need to know is get as far away from a city as possible. Third is the Milky Way. So when most photographers are talking about photographing the Milky Way, they're mostly speaking about the core of the Milky Way galaxy, which is uh, a higher density of stars and gas clouds, which makes it appear brighter in the night sky. So it just makes it a little bit easier to photograph. In order to find the Milky Way, it does matter where you are in the world. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, between the months of about April and September, look toward the Southern horizon. It doesn't rise super high in the Northern Hemisphere. So if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you're a little bit luckier. You can see it generally from February through October. And in June and July, it's completely overhead, which is really magnificent. So knowing where you are is also an important step to finding the Milky Way. Then, of course, there are some helpful tools like we've already discussed with PhotoPills, which is a really great app to line and figure out where the Milky Way will be, when it will rise and when it will set, things like that. A great way to get the best bang for your buck is going out to shoot sunset, and then all you have to do is wait a little bit for the Milky Way to rise. So like, for example, right now I was out shooting sunset and as you can see, it's getting darker and the stars are starting to come out. Um, so I'll be shooting some astro here in a little bit. And lastly is the moon phase. Um, the moon is obviously something very dear to me, but it can ruin your Milky Way shots. So it's important to double check the moon phase and when the moon will rise and when it will, will set as well. Um, but it is kind of a misconception that you have to have no moon. I think that a little bit of moon can help uh, some of your compositions. The moon can help to illuminate your foreground, which will help bring some detail out. Um, of course, it just depends on the phase because the moon can get very bright. So I usually stick to about quarter moon and less. Now getting into some camera settings. Um, it's important to, I think, always be shooting in raw format. 
over JPEG, but it's especially important when you're out shooting the night sky. And that's because your sensor is trying to get as much light as possible. And if you're shooting in RAW, it'll capture everything that hits your sensor. Whereas if you shoot in JPEG, um, your camera will toss out information that it deems not important in order to save space. So make sure you're shooting in RAW. Um, that some of the newer cameras, you can shoot uncompressed and lossless uncompressed RAW format. Um, I think it's typically ideal to shoot in uncompressed because you'll get as much detail as possible. But if you are short on space, you know, a lot of these high resolution cameras now have larger file sizes, so you can choose a lossless compressed format. Um, and you really won't be able to notice a huge difference unless you're like seriously pixel peeping. Another setting is using either an intervalometer or a shutter delay because the slightest little press even of your shutter button while you're shooting a long exposure will cause a little bit of camera shake. And so we want to minimize that as much as possible. So you can use an intervalometer if you like, but I think it's easiest just to use the built-in self timer. I usually will use a two second delay. Um, if it's a little windier, I'll use five to let my camera settle a little more, um, but that's definitely a setting that you want to set up. We've been on the run trying to capture this cool photo of Venus. It's in this awesome little saddle in these mountains here, but things move so fast, so it's a little bit stressful, but I think I got it. Of course, you'll want to shoot in manual mode on your camera for your exposure. Uh, our cameras aren't quite good enough to um, auto expose for the night sky yet, but it's probably coming in our future. Um, so make sure that you're using a camera that allows you to shoot in manual. As well, you'll need to shoot in a manual focus mode because again, they're not quite capable of autofocusing on the stars just yet. I think that manually focusing on the stars is the most difficult part of astrophotography because in our viewfinder, there are just these little tiny pinpoints and it's very difficult to tell if it's in focus or not. So don't fret, it's okay. Try taking a photo, zoom in, scope it out, see if you got it in focus. It's okay if you didn't nail it. I definitely don't nail it on the first try. So um, don't beat yourself up about it and just keep adjusting minimally and you'll get there eventually. There are times when you just nail your focus on the first try and it is such a win. You get such a dopamine rush and you're like, yes, this is amazing. Astrophotography is so fun, love it. <laughs> Realistically, it doesn't happen every time, but as you use your camera, you'll get used to where that focus actually is. Some of my lenses now, I can just go, oh, I know that's exactly where it's in focus. Um, so practice makes perfect. Quick tip, I love to turn on focus peaking on my camera as well. Focus peaking is when your camera will assign a color to the parts of your frame that are in focus. So it's really helpful to um, be able to tell when your stars are in focus, I think at least for me, when it's a slightly different color. Um, so I usually use the red focus peaking option um, just because I feel like it stands out a little more and my eye is better able to see when, it, when that star is in focus. Manual focus assist is another really, really helpful tool that the Sony cameras have. Um, I think they come built in where if you uh, adjust your focus ring, it'll automatically zoom in for you so you can see more. But if you hit the center button on the back of your camera, it'll zoom in even more. So you can really get a close up on your stars to make sure that they're in focus. Now let's get into some exposure settings. The fun part, I think. <laughs> so you wanna use a lens that has a really wide aperture and a wide field of view. Um, I'm using my Sony 14 millimeter F1.8 G master lens and the 20 millimeter uh, F1.8 G lens for astrophotography. Um, these lenses are really wide and um, fast apertures, so I can let in a lot of light. So for exposure, I'm usually leaving my aperture wide open at 1.8 or you know, 1.4, whatever the widest my lens is. A lot of people will like to stop down a little for sharpness, but I find that the Sony lenses are sharp all the way wide open and I don't feel the need to have to stop down. Shutter speed is probably my most changed setting. I like to play around with longer exposures and shorter exposures, um, but generally speaking, I'm usually around the eight to 13 seconds. Um, something to note here is something called the rule of 500. It was created a while ago, and I think with our high resolution cameras, I like to use more of a rule of 200 or rule of 300. Um, so basically what this is, is um, it tells you the longest shutter speed that you can have without getting star trails. 
Star trails are when you can see the little streaks of the star because we are on a spinning planet and your shutter speed is a little bit too long. So for example, since I'll use the 300, um, you'll take 300 and divide it by your focal length and that will give you the longest shutter speed that you can use. So say I'm shooting on my 20 millimeter, 300 divided by 20 is 15. So my longest shutter speed that I can use is 15 seconds. If you're on a crop sensor body, you will need to determine what your crop factor is for your sensor. Um, a lot of cameras I believe are like 1.5, so what you'll do there is take your focal length, multiply that times whatever your crop factor is. For this example, I'll use 1.5. So say that I'm shooting on a crop sensor and I'm wanting to be at like a 20 millimeter focal length. So I'll take 20, multiply that times 1.5, which is 30, so that's my 35 millimeter equivalent focal length. Then I'll take the 300 divided by 30, and that will give me 10. So 10 seconds is the longest that I can uh, have my shutter speed without getting star trails. A lot of people worry about ISO for astrophotography, and I think with these newer cameras and some of these even post-processing techniques that are eliminating noise, I don't think we need to worry quite as much anymore. Uh, it's, at least with my Sony A1 and my A7R5, I haven't had any issues. I've taken photos at 10,000 ISO and haven't had any issues, but usually I'm in the range of like 2,000 to 4,000, depending on the scene. White balance, I think, is an often overlooked setting for astrophotography. You can get away with using auto white balance, but sometimes if you've got maybe a little city light in the distance or even moonlight, it can throw off your white balance. And while it's easy to change this in post, it's just good practice to figure this out in camera. So I usually choose a custom white balance that's around 3,700 Kelvin, maybe up to 4,000, depending. Well, it's definitely too early. You can see the Milky Way right now. <laughs> but I'll still take a test shot. I'm out here right now taking a test shot, just kind of seeing where the Milky Way actually is. Um, it looks like it's maybe a little bit too early, but I'd rather be early than late, so I always take a few test shots before I actually think I need to. This is my first time shooting Astro here, and wow, this is actually a really cool composition. I'm super excited. It looks like the Milky Way is going to line up right over um, a mountain. There's like a little group of trees over. I'm just, I'm really excited about this composition. This water is going to make for an amazing reflection. It's super calm. Self timer, I'll turn on two seconds. It's getting there. The calmest water. So I usually use about 3,800 ish. Woo! I'm excited! Another tip for when you're out shooting at night is to assign a hotkey to your monitor brightness. When I'm shooting during the day, I usually like my screen to be brighter, but at come nighttime, I want to save my night vision as much as possible, so I'll set a key just to lower the brightness a bit. Cool. Can I uh, grab a test shot without lights just to see? Yeah. Cool. This is really cool. I, I do like this, yeah. Looks pretty sharp. Just wrapped up the first night of Astro here in Grand Teton National Park. Those test shots I took earlier turned out to be maybe the final shots I'm gonna use. The moon came up and was a little bit brighter than I was hoping for, so it washed out the Milky Way a little bit, but I'm super stoked with these images because the water, I don't know if you can see this behind me, but it might be the calmest water I've ever seen. So it was a perfect reflection of the Milky Way. Super, super stoked to edit these photos. 
All right, so you've got all your gear set up. You're at this location that's beautiful and you see the Milky Way, you take your shot and you're like, oh my gosh, there's the Milky Way. I'm so excited. And maybe you forget to take into consideration what the rest of your frame looks like. Um, I have been there. I get very excited about seeing the Milky Way, but something that will take your photos to the next level is taking into consideration how that Milky Way is interacting with your foreground. Um, so composition, I think, is something that really takes astrophotos further. Um, things like even light trails or um, aligning the Milky Way behind something. So it's got this sort of interaction. Um, rule of thirds, we've got some leading lines, maybe there's a road in front. Um, just taking into consideration these compositional aspects that you probably already know, they also apply to your astrophotography. Yesterday I got the Milky Way over some water for a really cool reflection um, and tonight I'm shooting the Milky Way behind a barn so we've got this really cool like human element to it so it's a different way of photographing the Milky Way instead of having it you know kind of look like it's coming out of mountains um, it's just sort of interacting with the sort of man-made environment which is kind of fun. Okay a little less light okay that's perfect all right ready three two, one, light on. Okay, light off. Oh yeah, that looks cool. I've been having so much fun chasing the Milky Way, shooting some, some stars, but I wanted to try something a little different. I found this really cool windy road in front of the Tetons, so I'm gonna take a few light trail photos and see what comes out. There's a car coming up the road where I wanna take uh, some light trails, so I'm timing it to see how long of a shutter speed I'm going to need. I think I'm probably gonna to need to end up stacking a few together because it's a very long road, but this will give me uh, a little bit of a basis of what I can expect. I think a lot of people assume that you have to wait until it's actually night to take um, light trails for cars, but um, it's actually really helpful to do a few preparations before it's dark out, um, similar to astrophotography. So I took a blue hour shot just to kind of see exactly what my composition would look like and it was easier for me to frame things out when I had a little bit of light left. Um, and then also it's really helpful to set up a timer. If you can get a car driving the road that you're going to be shooting later, um, that'll give you a basis for how long your ex exposure will need to be, how long your shutter speed will need to be. Um, so just a couple little things to do beforehand will make your job a little bit easier. Okay, I'm ready whenever you are. Let me know when you're about to go. Okay, I'm ready. All right, perfect. Perfect timing of the time. Still going. Don't go too far though, I wanna go home. Another astro tip for you, whenever I'm out, I always make sure to pack one of these little Z seats in my backpack. It weighs like an ounce. It's a nice little insulated cushion that gives me a comfortable place to sit. Um, it's a little creature comfort that you can just bring in your bag, um, make things a little more comfortable for you. So highly recommend one of these. We get really hung up on the Milky Way because it is very exciting, but there are so many different things that you can do with night photography. You can get really deep into it with a telescope, maybe a super telephoto lens and photograph galaxies. You can take photos of car trails. Um, you can take environmental portraits of people where maybe they're shining a headlamp. Astrophotography, no matter what type of, of astrophotography you're doing, somehow has a way of grabbing you. you try something and it's like this addicting, amazing 
so satisfying thing. And I think it's because it's so challenging, but people tend to gravitate toward, you know, oh, I tried this one thing and I love it and it was so fun and I can't wait to do it all the time. Um, and it, it's definitely something that can take over your life if you're not careful, but that's what's fun. You know, we, we do this for a reason. We're passionate about photography and creating, um, making things that don't appear in the real life. You know, that's a lot of astrophotography. You can't really see light trails in real time. You know, you can't see the Milky Way as clear with your eyes as you can with the camera. So it has this just incredible, magnificent way of really drawing you in. So let me know down in the comments what your favorite kind of astrophotography is and maybe what type of astrophotography you'd like to try that you haven't yet. The next episode is going to be editing. Nate and I are going to walk you through our process for all the photos that we've taken throughout the week, but it's getting dark. The stars are coming out. I got to go shoot. So I'll see you next time.